Bible smack. <laughs> All right. I know it's been a little while since I did a video. Uh, for the most part, been focusing on church ministry, uh, living the real world. You know, got a job which I get to help minister to people in need, and so that's cool. And basically, um, you know, on Facebook a little bit, and I have like done, you know, I'll do preaching at home, this kind of kind of came from COVID, I'll do the preaching at home, then I'll do the preaching at the church, um, it started off as the church got shut down, I wasn't legally, well, sort of legally allowed to go across state lines, according to the, the tyranny of the local governor, but necessary, you know, the court kind of said, oh, by the way, that's not constitutional, and so that went away, but Nevertheless, um, you know, decided to keep on preaching online as well as preaching at my church. So, let's see here. I'm going to take plenty of juice to keep me going. <laughs> and it is a suicide, so. <laughs> Which means I'm mixing the drinks not alcoholic drinks, not poison, just, <laughs> <sighs> anyhow, all right, so, I saw this lady on, uh, YouTube, and it was one of those why I left Christianity videos, I always get drawn to these things, like a moth to the flame, you know, um, don't want to see people go to hell, and, on one level, there is that, you know, when they're gone, they're gone. But on the other level, you know, you just don't want to see anybody um, go to hell, <laughs> you know. So I, I try to leave the, uh, I try to be like the Motel 7, I think it was. We'll leave the light on for you, you know. But um, anyhow, this lady, her name was Jennifer Fishburne. And... I thought her testimony was very interesting, and, um, because, you know, you do have that kind of usual class of things. You got those who are like, oh, well, I was, you know, in the youth group, and, you know, blah, 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 and then, like, you know, sin was fun, and so now I'm not a Christian, <laughs> and you, you see a lot of that, but, um, she, you know, tried to make it painstakingly clear uh, that she was really religious most all her life, and it really engaged in the Bible and all those things. And, you know, as I was watching it, uh, you know, I, I kind of thought, you know, this is a lady who could have been one of my aunts. And in fact, there's a possibility. I, I don't know for certain. She said things about Moody which we have Moody Bible College, and, you know, she was talking about Moody in the 70s. Well, my, um, many of my aunts and uncles and my father went to Moody, and um, it's kind of funny, uh, one of which, my Aunt Patty, um, I don't know if I'm telling the story exactly correctly, but, uh, correctly, but basically, she met uh, my Uncle Rich, and he was a Hare Krishna at the time. You know, it was like these people at the airports giving people flowers with this one ponytail. And basically, um, I think uh, he got saved not long after that. And then they fell in love, got married. They did some missionaries and stuff. And then uh, one of their uh, daughters died on the missionary field. Which is my cousin. <laughs> but... Um, Anyhow, now one who I think, if she did go, someone was confusing. Sometimes, like, you know, Moody had produced a whole lot of things, and they talked about these videos that were produced by Moody. So, does that mean that she watched them as a student, or that she wasn't a student but was affected by the ministry? I don't know. But if she did go, um, 
then about that time, we have the famous preacher and uh, I think a president in the Moody, Warren Wearsby. My Aunt Ruth, I believe, served as a secretary for him, so she could have met her. Possibly. Well, she told her story in this video. And I'll tell you what, it's interesting because she is a uh, biblical scholar. And um, it's different for women, uh, especially going the route of biblical scholarship. See... You know, especially if we're talking about systematic theology, but the uh, the seminary life becomes very male dominated the higher up you go. It's probably about fifty fifty at Bible college, but many of these are women who, just by the nature of things, kind of go there to get married and marry a pastor. They they feel like that's their duty, so let's learn the trade so that you could be a better preacher's wife. And they see that as kind of like its own office. Okay. So, um, that's good. Then, well, I noticed that once I started working on the, you know, higher education on the master's level, a lot of those girls are gone. And then you get um, just a few women. You know what I mean? Just really small amount. And that can be overwhelming for the women to be in such a male-dominated environment. Because men are masculine. You know, <laughs> we're working on it. <laughs> we're not working very well this generation. But men are generally masculine. And when we get into theology, our masculinity reveals itself. And we can put on our armor. And kind of go at it like intellectual gladiators. Okay. We're not supposed to be physically violent. And so the way that we kind of release our testosterone kind of comes out in systematic theology. And so you put on your armor, you duke it out. And it's just like the old days when you played hockey or football or amateur wrestling or you know boxing or whatever you know you duke it out you you grunt you, you feel like you've come for something well you know women have their heart on their sleeves and they're not putting their armor on and especially in a religious setting you know that's where their sensitivities are at their peak and so it can be uh I know a lot of women just have very negative experiences going through the higher education. So, I'm not saying that to, you know, put people in a box or anything like that, but just to say this is kind of the reality, this is kind of the experience, and it's things that I've seen from close friends who are going through that. And um, as we see here, you know, some of those traits, uh, we see a lot of her spiritual experience. And the worldview starts to shape itself towards the end of the program. But towards the beginning, it's all about her family relationships. And then how, you know, she was taken to this experience and that experience. Whereas with a guy... You kind of want to get to a point where you're solid in one place and one standing position. Now, that's not necessarily to say that guys don't go through transi transitions. Um, I had a friend who went through many transitions of religious faith and eventually leaving all religious faith for atheism and then coming back. Not to my point of view, but just, you know, coming to a religious point of view again. And um, he admitted, we kind of did a a, a kind of quasi-debate. And he admitted to me, years later, once he had come back to faith in God, that he was kind of lying, not 
simply lying to people, he's lying to himself, okay? And, you know, um, I'm kind of, I'm of the same opinion generally, but I'm a little bit more easygoing about how this all works itself out because we're talking about human experience instead of what's correct on paper. So generally, I do tend to believe that a person who is truly born again will have the fruits of the Spirit, and one of those fruits is faith. And so, in a general way, I could see that working out. Now, there is a question of, does the faith always remain steady? Could a person's faith kind of be like a bobber in the water, where the bobber goes down and gets plunged underneath and comes back up? Could a believer lose their faith and then regain their faith? Um, that is something that I think is in the realm of possibilities. But as far as my stance goes, I really don't have a certainty on it. I just think it's something possible at this point. So um, I side with you know, once you're saved, you're always saved, and therefore you're a believer. Um, but I guess there is a little bit of agnostic approach to this in the sense that I could be wrong, and there could be people that really through um, not only some uh, delusion, but also through work of uh, Satan, there are those who could fall and backslide to a point where they're like um, unbelieving and yet believing. Because, you know, you're supposed to believe in your heart. Well, maybe their mind, they lost their mind, and so they stopped believing in their mind, even though it was buried in their heart. But, in general, I don't totally accept that notion. So I'm not saying that, like, you know, here's the... Here's the way it is. But, you know, there is something to where, uh, could that be a possibility? The Arminian view is one where we view that people can become just apostate and lose their entire salvation. Then there is the, um, the strict Calvinist view would be that you always have faith, probably that you are assured of this through this doctrine of election, and then you have this lordship salvation in which if you're, um, you're either, you know, all in it or you're not. And if you're not, well, you were never, not only were you not ever saved, but God chose not to save you. Maybe God will change his mind before you die. But generally, you're just stuck. You know, there's, there's not a blood, not a drop of Jesus' blood was wasted on you. <laughs> you know, and that's that. That's a big problem in itself. But I guess that goes beyond what we're talking about here. So she was raised in generally an evangelical family, and she had a conservative evangelical starting point. But um. This was her being raised, and, you know, she talks about her decision, and she has a little bit of scorn in her throat as far as this decision, like, um, how dare they say that I believed, and then that was it, and I was saved, and there's nothing I can do about it. How dare you save my soul, give me eternal life, <laughs> you know. Now, that's, that's, that's an interesting point, because, you know, the good news should be good news. And I guess where this is at is that there's this idea that if you're a child, you have no responsibility. But 
I think that even a child is capable of responsibility to a certain degree. When I was three years old, um, my parents had a rifle, and basically, um, I got in a pretty horrible argument, and my mother had lashed out at me fairly severely, and so I went to the closet and I grabbed the gun. And then my parents just kind of talked me down. Instead of trying to fight me at it and beat me up, they just said, no, you don't do this. This is not a good thing. You love your parents. You're not going to be like that. And I just dropped the rifle and started crying. And that was it. And, and you know, it was amazing. I mean, I, I got whooped plenty of times when I was little. But for some reason... They knew how to have a heart-to-heart -heart instead of just, you know, go off. But I think if um, if I had, if there were bullets in there and I pulled the trigger, whether or not I was held responsible, I would have accomplished the feat. Okay, and therefore there's responsibility of whether or not I'm going to shoot the gun. Now, um, it's kind of ironic. She, so she has this covenant with Jesus. She asks him to forgive his sins. And then later on in life, she gets away from all of it. And she gets in the military. And she ends up falling in love. And I don't think she got in the military. But she fell in love with this fellow. He's Jewish. And he was living kind of wild. But she fell in love with him. He got into the military, and then um, they had a bad fight. I don't think they were totally broken up, but it seemed like they were break, broken up because he didn't want her to be friends. And then eventually, a lot of other guys wanted to get with her, and then she ends up pregnant. Now, um, luckily, with her upbringing, she decided not to abort the baby, but have the baby adopted. And it's weird because that ends the story there. And so, you know, I, I, I'm really wondering what's going on here. But she had a covenant with a Jew when she was five, the Jesus, you know. And then she gets a covenant with this other Jew. And then, like, um, breaks that off. Now, we have forgiveness, but we also have... Um, hurt and damage, okay? And basically, when you set out to do whatever you do in life, just like if you run a race, there's a certain thing to how you make your first steps. And if you make bad choices early on, they will haunt you. And so I think that there is an area in her character when it comes to faithfulness. Now, there's a certain loyalty that she did have. All right, she was a very devoted person. But there's a little bit of a lack of loyalty. So, I notice how we have that relationship issue. But then when we see some other things pop up, you'll you'll see it again. And that is when she's trying to work out her faith, there are some issues of loyalty to the faith. You know, is it this type of Christianity or is it that type of Christianity? And I think she admits that during an early period, she's really being tossed to and fro, and she's not studying the Bible. Well, during that time, you can develop presuppositions, and these presuppositions will affect the way you act and steer things in the future. So she goes from um, an early dispensationalism. 
And she talks about her experience with the rap shirt and watching the movie A Thief in the Night. And she talked about how it was scary. And it's the most evil thing in Christianity. Well, it's the most scary thing in Christianity. But, it's not the most evil thing. Because what's going to happen is that the devil is trying to destroy us. And the world is trying to wipe us out. And these forces build slowly grow greater and greater. But at a certain point, the Lord will save his people from his wrath. And so now they'll be saved from the wrath of hell, but this also wrath of God upon the earth. That seems like a bonus to me. Um, but the fear issue is for the unregenerate. The unregenerate need to have fear about where they are at and be afraid of the judgment. Now, you don't have to be afraid of the judgment if you get saved. And you get saved, what, by Jesus Christ. Now, another fact is that you don't see a high amount of discussion about Jesus throughout this video. There's little pieces here and there, but for the amount of religion that we're talking about, you'd figure there would be more. And this is what I encountered with my friend. He had one religion, then another religion, then another religion. And yeah, most of them were claiming uh, Christianity, but they're really just suits. They're external. You know, well, I'm part of this belief system. Oh, and then there's that belief system, and that belief system, and that belief system. Well, it's great that you have all these systems, but what's underneath it? You know, when Jesus was getting after the Pharisees, he talked about, you clean the outside of the cup, but the inside is full of filth and dirtiness. That is uh, one of the big problems. Um, and, you know, generally... Uh, we, we see that kind of switch back and forth, and so she bounces into things that are Reformed and Calvinistic, then to things that are dispensational, then she goes to this period where she's a Messianic Jew. Being a dispensational and being a Messianic Jew are worlds apart, because the Messianic Jews believe that they're Jews. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that, and eventually, to her credit, she gets out of that system. But um, it does leave its scars, especially dealing with her husband. Now, I'm going to go ahead and I'll put this video into uh, the response section of her video. Okay. And Jennifer, if you're watching this, I, I do want to say this. Now, on the macro level, when we talk about ideas like patriarchy, I think that on the macro level, it's a good system because when you develop a tribal order, then you don't need the tyranny of the government. And so the idea of the men rising up and the men of the people and the town, you know, that draws strength. And also the men of the faith and the men of the church draws strength. It helps two things. Number one, the externals, and also it helps the boys and the men. If they have something to aspire to, then it will um, move them and motivate them to uh, a greater holiness. But it is not a tool for getting someone in a close relationship with God, and it can't stop men from being uh, abusive with certain things. So when you talk about this movement, and um, in general, remember, I've just watched your video. Um, I cannot judge your soul as far as, I mean, I could judge your claims of faith and stuff like that, but I, I can't tell if you're being objective with your tale or not, but I'm going to take you at face value. And I know that men can get this way, and I know that there are uh, cultic guys, and there's cultic women too, but there are cultic guys, and so 
I can see, you know, how that could have happened, and also I can sympathize. I think that um, you were a beautiful woman, and more importantly, you were a godly woman. You were a pearl of great price, okay? And obviously, it sounds like you did a good job raising your children, and, you know, he must have been a fool not to have uh, cared about that. So, that is something that is deeply wrong. However, this is where we hit with a struggle. Is religion your relationship with your fellow man, or is it a relationship with God? Now, I do think that she did state that uh, she's not, she said she didn't leave her the, um, you know, basically the injuries of the church. Okay, so... Uh, I don't want to overly state that case, but I do think that's a natural thing. I think that, like, you know, naturally that's hurtful, and so naturally I react with sympathy for a uh, poor witness on this man's behalf. And, you know, as far as the SJWs go, no, I don't bear any responsibility for that guy's behavior. Uh, Ecclesia, you know, um, it was not Ecclesia, Ezekiel chapter 18, you know, the father is not guilty of the sins of the son, nor is the son guilty of the sins of the father. We are judged individually. All right, so, you know, so we see from here we start talking about hermeneutical extremes. She starts getting attracted to two different movements. Those who are termed hyper dispensationalist. And the hyper-dispensationalists, they have a point, but it can go to an extreme. And that is that when you look at the New Testament, not all the New Testament is written to you, the reader, who is not Jewish. Okay. Uh, a lot of this is context of the times, the places. And you can see that in both the Old and New Testament. Um, it's typically, the hypers will go all the way... Till like, you've got a handful of New Testament books that apply to you, and everything else is Jewish. Um, I'd say it's more like a half and half. But, you know, hey. Then, she adds on the idea of preterism. And not to the normal evangelical partial preterism, which is usually matched with an all-millennial interpretation. But she wants a full preterism. The full preterism would say that the Gospels are concerned about first century Judaism. And that's it. And so everything stops really at the climax of the um, destruction of the Jewish temple. And so you have two similar themes, and so what she's going to end up doing is she's going to sew these two together. Even though they hermeneutically contradict each other. You see, the dispensational point of view is based on consistent literalism. So when we look at a text, uh, we don't want to impose meaning upon it. We want to expound meaning from it. And when we do that, we see uh, what is meant for the Jews. But there are things that are just miraculous. And so we don't uh, look at these stories and think that they're going to be fulfilled symbolically. We think they're going to be filled literally. You know, um, the Exodus. I think most scholars would argue that the Exodus, uh, in its own worldview, was telling people that this really happened, that Moses came out from there. And, um, you know, the old liberals, the, the ones from, you know, my dad said that this was taught uh, back at Campbellsville, and maybe, I don't think it was at Moody, but 
nevertheless, he had those who said, hey, you know, um, when they walked and, you know, Moses parted the Red Sea, well, actually, that was just a windy storm that kind of made things dry. And it, it looked like a miracle, but it really wasn't. You had those ideas, but the message of the scriptures was to be taken literally. And um, when we find this idea of those who took the uh, prophecy, the prophets, to be completely symbolic, and the more moderate to liberal types would even throw in words like imagination. Now, imagination would lead you to the idea of mythology. And mythology says that something is fiction. And not quite true. And yes, it has some sort of moral truth to it. But generally, it is a thing that is not true or honest. And so, um, this is where liberalism would come in and say, the Bible's got lots of problems, but it wasn't meant to be accurate. It was just, you know, a bunch of good stories to tell us good morals. But, let's get rid of our prejudice of modernism. So let's get it rid of the atheism and the evolution and naturalism and materialism and all these other concepts that have nothing to do with scripture. Once you get rid of all that, you'll find, you know, we look at it academically, what were the other guys writing about? Well, when I'm looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls, or if I'm looking at the War Scrolls, then I'm finding these Armageddon pictures, and even though they're not true, even though they are fictitious, um, they're portraying literally miraculous things. They don't want you to think that these things are not true. There's no, oh, we were just kidding you guys. But we do find that in the pagan, Gentile, Hellenistic, Greek writers. And from them, you have this idea of, like, there is, especially in Plato, we have the idea of the thing. You have the thing, and you have the idea of the thing. And so, it's not about the thing itself. It's not about my physical body. You can't touch my physical body. You're watching on the screen. Who knows? Maybe you'll be watching this 20 years later and I'm dead. Hope not. I'll ask the last lot of that. But <laughs> nevertheless, we'll go with 100 years. Okay, you're watching this in 100 years from now. Okay, I feel a little better now. <laughs> but 100 years now, you're watching this and I no longer exist. Didn't matter. If I was, if I'm here right now in my 3D, you're still watching a video. So it doesn't matter of me it's the ideas that are coming from me that are important, at least important to you. So, the uh, the Platonists, they would look at this thing and, you know, it's the idea behind the thing. So when they look at the Bible, it's not the literal words of the Bible that matter. It's the ideas behind the words. Well, that becomes another story than the story that we're reading. And so that becomes the problem there. Well, essentially, when you get this uh, this preterism, that's what's going to be going on. It's only going to go in the direction that you're wanting to take it instead of what it's actually saying. And that's what you're going to get with a full preterism. And so at this point, her arguments leave the uh, ideas of the Bible believer, and they go full blast into, um, you know, <laughs> into liberalism. So then she starts talking about how the books of the Bible were written so much later. Oh, the gospel writers wrote 40 or 50 years later. Now, Studying the history of this, and there's a book that I can always recommend to people. And oh, you can get it, it's 
very rare itself, but you can get it for free on my uh, blog. And that is a new look and an old word. And so at this point, I talk about Bible translations, textual criticism, the whole history of the thing, the history of the Bible, the history of the textual criticism, uh, some interesting stories involving the Catholics and the Gnostics and um, the Baptists and all sorts of groups. Okay. So one of the issues is that um, most of the liberals argued that the uh, New Testament wasn't written until like 300 A.D. And that was the orthodoxy back in the 1800s when we first started seeing liberalism appear. But then they started realizing, hold on, this does not match when we look at the writings of the church fathers who had enough quotes to have a whole Bible together just quoting scripture out of their sermons. And they had those sermons written out before the 3rd century. And in fact, they had guys who were dead by 110, 115 AD. And so they said, well, no, that's impossible. Now, they did have the New Testament Apocrypha. So we did have mythology, but the mythology of the Apocrypha went the opposite way. It tried to make Jesus look more human instead of trying to make him look more divine. So, you have this other set. And when they say, oh, it was written 40 or 50 years later, no, 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 no. That was as far away as they could make it. They wanted to make it as far as possible, and they failed. They wanted to make the, the, the authors write as late as possible. But that wasn't saying that they couldn't write earlier. So this is a this is fallacious. Oh well, you know, he's it's like, okay, my maximum bench was 295 pounds. And um basically um well then you couldn't have done 250 pounds. No, my maximum bench is 295, so theoretically I could have done 250, which is less, right? Uh, I couldn't do 300 or 350, okay, because that was my max, okay? So, like, if the max is this far, then it could have been earlier, okay? That's how they, they just twisted you, okay? Um, and there's a lot of reasons, uh, especially... The life of Paul. We know that Paul died, and yet the book of Acts does not record his death. And yet the book of Acts is the second, uh, with the Gospel of Luke is the first. And then we know the Gospel of Luke borrowed, um, borrowed from Mark, probably Matthew, not necessarily. But, um, you know, we see that, so that puts things farther forward and closer to the apostles. And of course, um, John dies near 100 AD. So, you know, most of his writings are anywhere from 80 to 95 AD, which is after the destruction of the temple. So, factually, all that goofy stuff about, oh no, they were they, they didn't know what they were doing. They weren't writing it. Well, yeah, they were writing it. Okay, they had people who could write all right. Now, some people couldn't write. All right. Peter was not a great writer. That's true. But John learned how to write pretty decently. And Luke was definitely a good writer. And he was uh, very educated. He was a medical doctor himself. So, you know, you, you did have people. Matthew, being a tax collector, had to be literate. He had to know how to write stuff down. He might not have been a great poet from that, but we know that he was a writer. And we also know church history says, and the critical, uh, the textual critics don't start saying anything, but till about 17, 1800 years later. So 
They're not close to the action. The historians are close to the action. And so you need to take the the empirical testimony of the histories first. And there is no history of Mark being the first gospel. There is no history of these being late gospel written and all that kind of stuff. No. These are conjectures and theories. And these theories will be wrapped around naturalistic philosophy and even the evolutionary theory. They believe that the text evolved because the religion had to, be, to evolve. And the religion had to evolve because the society had to evolve. And the society had to evolve because man had to evolve. And man had to evolve because all the animals evolved. And then life evolved because the stars and the planets and you know, space evolved out of the Big Bang. So what we get there is... Um, all that worldview, working all these things out. Now, this lady, uh, she's not, uh, she's a liberal, but she's not a atheist or naturalist. But that does creep into her thinking this way. She would, I would identify, you know, she said New Age or something. Not that she identified with New Age, but that she would be called that. I'd kind of be more specific. I would say Gnostic, okay? A lot of her spirituality is more Gnostic based. You know, you think of the Demiurge and, you know, the creation of the world and not being as good as God and something spiritual beyond that. Um, I find hints of that there, you know. So to worry about the law, let's get away from the law. But, um, you know, the, the heart of Jesus is ripped out of there. And how do you, how do you make these arguments? Um, I believe that, well, let me go get away from what I believe first. Um, when you look at the book of Daniel and you hear the story of Nebuchadnezzar, you have a, um, a God above all gods. He's not just a local God or he would have nothing to do with Nebuchadnezzar. And, you know, you have an eternal value and you have all this stuff lined up in the prophecies. But she also doesn't do that. You know, she knows there's a three to four hundred prophecies that concern Christ. And even if you can wrestle around two or three of them, you still got a lot there, you know. And when it comes to Bible prophecy, not only do we have things like, oh, okay. Um, here's like the Jews and they're still around and the Christians and they got their religion everywhere, just like it said in the Bible. And wow, the Bible's printed everywhere. The best selling book ever, you know, so, you know, that's a big deal, but here's the other thing. All right. We can go with conspiracy. Maybe it's a big Zionist conspiracy to keep the Jews and the dispensationalists. What about the Arabs? How can you prophesy, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago, that there will always be these genetic cousins who are also uh, divinely rivalrous of the Jews, hating the Jews, and that go on thousands and thousands of years later, that they preserved their people long enough to hate the Jewish people for thousands of years. How can you predict that? Okay. Um, there's a lot with Bible prophecy that's not really understood here. And, you know, when we think about this, well, you know, the, the Bible was only meant. It was only meant for this time period. All right, well, Psalm 105. All right, 105, 8 through 11. Well, I'll go through 7 through 11. He is the Lord our God. That's the Jehovah our God. His judgments are in all the earth. All the earth, not just peace. 
He hath remembered his covenant forever. 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 Okay. Can you name that movie? <laughs> yeah. Um, what does it say? The word which he commanded to a thousand generations. Which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac. And confirmed the same Jacob for a law unto Israel for an everlasting covenant. Saying unto thee will I give the land of Canaan the lot of your inheritance. Well, there it is. And here we are after Israel was lambasted, reduced to shreds, and yet now one of the most powerful countries in the world. And also um, keeping a lot of the stuff together, even with a lot of Muslim attacks. You know, we're, they're still preserving lots of archaeology. And they restore the language of Hebrew. And um, now the world is recognizing Jerusalem as the capital. Okay. So all of that. I mean, they tried to destroy the whole people. All the Jews were going to get wiped out by Hitler. Yet here they still are. Okay. The most influential people on the earth. So, you know, Bible prophecy really answers that question of, if that's still, you know, applying to today, then hey, you know, then the Bible is meant for us. Otherwise, it wouldn't keep the prophecies for us. Okay. Um, let's see here. So, you know, and, you know, I want to say this, like, um, when, you know, when I'm listening to her, I know that there is a intellectual problem and I'm trying to, you know, kind of give some answer to that and solve that. I think there is a thing to be said for psychological trauma. Um, and this is a, a big deal in a different way. You know, this is a, a mother, probably a grandmother. And, um, you know, um, just a lot of emotion there. And so, you know, I think part of her has that emotion behind the scenes. And that's just natural. But I don't mean that to demean her experience, nor her scholarship. She probably knows the Bible better than me. And I've got two degrees and I'm working on a doctorate. So it's, you know, I think it's objective to say that, you know, I would know the Bible a lot. And that's something to be said if somebody knows the Bible more. Okay. But, you know, she's a generation ahead of me. Looks like she studied. Uh, apparently said something about doing translations and stuff. So, you know, I, I don't disrespect her academic prowess on any level. But these things are, these are spiritual issues that go beyond your academic knowledge. And, you know, I do pray for her. And um, it's hard because, you know, typically that's not a place that you're going to get very much fruit. But, you know, uh, I pray for her family and I pray for her. And so... I hope, you know, this could, you know, make somebody think. But, um, let's see here. Oh, yeah, she threw out something also that was interesting. And she talked about the evidence that she's seen in the Electric Universe. Hey, I'm a fan of the Electric Universe. And uh, the Thunderbolts guys, they have lots of really good educational stuff. And, um... I'm not opposed to other theories or ways of science. And so I developed a cosmology theory. You can look it up. It's um, the New Year's cosmology class. And I incorporate the ideas of the electric universe and their research into my cosmology theory. I have 
other uh, references too, and I've, it's it's really my own thing, especially at the end with my theory of the uh, Great Flood of Noah. But essentially, um, I've got no problem with that. Um, however, finding an explanation just doesn't cut it. Um, you need something more. And what I mean by that is, you know, we, we talk about, well, maybe there's a God. And a God who just doesn't care about anybody. If, um, if God doesn't care about you, then maybe God could be your enemy one day. The world don't care about you. Well, I mean, what happens if you get a disease and you're raped and you're, yeah, you're beaten and cannibals come and eat your internal organs or maybe dogs, you know? Um, and you have this nightmarish thing. And oh yeah, there's some space alien that you call God. There's no peace. And... You know, we talk about, you know, this need, need for liberty and freedom. I believe that God is a, liberta a liberator. And I believe that the, the Bible is designed to give us freedom. But yet, if we don't have security, then freedom is pretty fleeting. You know, anarchy is not built to last. So, God bless you. We'll catch you later on Bob Smack.